Broadcasting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America. Bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Ben Crossman, and everyone out there, I hope that you're doing well. You are, hey, you know, uh, it's Friday as always. I think that's why Ralph always enjoys coming on on Fridays because it's a good day. It's it's uh, relaxing and we have a whole host of different uh, stories for you. It's going to be a lot of fun. And yes, Ralph is waiting in the wings oh so patiently. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to say thank you for joining us here on Computer America. Uh, before we get started, ComputerAmerica.com. That's where you'll find everything, including the show notes, past shows, future shows, this show. This show in particular, Ralph spends a lot of time and energy. And really, we do appreciate all of the effort he puts into the show notes that will be available on the website. If you'd like to follow up, learn more, uh, we're probably not going to get to all the stories uh, as usual but we're going to do our best. And hey, uh, check those out at ComputerAmerica.com or, of course, over on Ralph's website where, hey, if you want to find that, that's also in the show notes or just search Ralph Bond uh, Wix. So all that being said, um, trying to think anything else. Uh, again, it's Friday. Uh, that, uh, that about sums it up. So, okay, let's go ahead and bring Ralph in. And he's you know being oh so patient. And let's bring him in, get this whole thing started. Ralph, how you doing? Welcome back on Computer I'm, America. I'm doing great. Well, I'm great because I'm still alive. I'll tell you, holy smokers. <laughs> this is such a weird world we're in right now. Uh, <laughs> I was about to say, I didn't know you were at risk of not, uh, of, you know, not being alive. But I guess <laughs> well, with the uh, pandemic, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm in that wonderful, uh, what do they call it? Senior citizens with underlying conditions category. Yay. Uh, <laughs> so so yeah. I hide. I hide right here. You see this room? This, yeah. is, <laughs> this is where I hide out most of the time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and of course, for long term, you know, for, for long time listeners of the show, they'll know that you were out for a couple of weeks there. Uh, uh, about It's about two years, two or three years now, right? Where you had heart surgery. Um, oh, my gosh. Well, you want to get you, time warp. That was in 2011. Can you believe Wait, that? What? Yeah, my open oh. heart surgery was 2011, December 2011. Why do guy. I think it was like three <laughs> years ago? That is crazy. Well, it's, you know, it's fast. Did you have Time any other, did, did, do you have like a second heart that they worked on, you know, about three years ago? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I don't have two hearts. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, I, I, <laughs> but I have I, a rebuilt I one. <laughs> I have I, a rebuilt I, one. <laughs> I had to try. So, but, but yeah, so uh, obviously you do have underlying conditions, even though you seem <laughs> yeah. so healthy and hale here on the show. But, uh, but I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that you're still alive. Yay, me too. Uh, <laughs> You know, don't 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 go catching this thing. And I know that a lot of people out there, uh, you know, coronavirus still dominates the news cycle. Oh, gosh, um, yeah. I, you know, it's uh, it's everywhere around us. And really, uh, Ralph, I don't know about you, but uh, especially like around here, uh, especially mm -hmm. with the changes to dining and restaurants and mm -hmm. uh, the way that a lot of um, you know grocery stores, there's like aisles that you can only walk up one way and down the other, yep. like, like little things like that. Um, they're here to stay for many, many, yeah. many months to come. Yeah. Uh, it's what ha to, to you, and this is just you know just us talking here before we get to the stories. Sure. Just to you, what 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 has been kind of like the most drastic thing that you've seen that you think is going to stick around? Well, I think you're right on target. For example, we went to a Columbia store, a clothing store, and they had it very well orchestrated with all the six foot apart dots on the floor. And right. you go through the store in one way and exit a certain way. And, and so all of that, uh, I think you're right until we have a vaccine. And it's not just getting the vaccine, everybody. We all know this. It's not until the vaccine can be reproduced and created in a incredible quantities and distributed around the world and, and administered before we're quote unquote, out of the woods. And we may kind of sort of never be out of the woods. I mean, I hate to be doom and gloom, but who knows? I, I think our lifestyles are just going to change 
forever and ever. I was thinking the other day, Ben, how mm -hmm. I used to kind of get sort of amused when I'd see photographs of uh, Japanese or Chinese citizens walking around always with masks on, right? And I thought that was kind of strange. And that now was more I of totally like a culture. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That, that was more like a culture shock because here in the U.S., yep. I mean, if uh, I, 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 you know, you ride cramp subways in New York City yeah. or you see buses, yeah. you know, in Texas or something like that, and they're cramped and, you know, you see people coughing, sneezing, hopefully into their mm -hmm. arm or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and you thought, oh, whatever. <laughs> now, uh, you're right. We've uh, we've definitely taken a, a step towards um, a more conscious society about yeah. germs and spread and the spread of this virus. Um, well, and that's a that's a perfect segue into today's show notes and the stories I think we're so. going to do because I kind of went coronavirus technology crazy here for the I don't first blame number you. of stories. I don't blame <laughs> you one bit because you know uh, we we try to focus on other things here on day to, on a day to day basis, but I you know there have been entire days where I've just kind of said you know what instead of talking about uh, coronavirus for the 15th time, I'm going to replay that episode of IBM where we talked about you know their quantum computers or something like that. Yes, it, yes. I, you know um, so I. It has dominated the news, and you have other stories. I definitely do see that, but there's nothing wrong with touching on it again. And you have taken it upon yourself, because for those who don't know, Ralph Bond is Computer America's science and tech trends correspondent. Uh, the the reason that you know science is there before technology is because you know biomedicine and mm -hmm. you know kind of bionics and things like that play right. a huge role in what attracts your attention. We've noticed so right. It's a good vein of coronavirus stories. So let's go ahead and start with story number one, and let's yeah. get going. Yeah, this is a blast. So this is a story I picked up from Business Insider. The headline, Harvard and MIT researchers are developing a face mask that lights up when it detects coronavirus. So we all know about the face masks that are so popular now in our country. And primarily the purpose is to protect people around you. It's not so much to protect you from incoming but to protect those around us. So this is kind of an interesting thing. This story and the, and the next story really are all about taking face masks to a new level of, of technology. Mm -hmm. So here's the story. For the past six years, bioengineers at MIT and Harvard have been developing sensors that can detect viruses, including the ones that cause Zika and Ebola. Now what's happening is they're adapting their technology to screen for the new coronavirus. And this MIT and Harvard, I call them a dream team, hopes to embed the sensors inside face masks so that when an infected person breathes, coughs, or sneezes, the sensors light up to signal the presence of the virus. I mean, it's kind of hard to imagine this, but it's I, pretty cool. <laughs> I, and, and, and I definitely like how they had to specify that it's the person wearing the mask if they caught, because let's face it, if this lights up because someone else coughed in your face, you have bigger problems than, yes. you know, this. Yes. It, so it, it's, like you said, it's for the person wearing the mask. And that's yes, cool. that's right. And that's a good point that leads to the next little uh, nugget in the show notes. And by the way, friends, come out to the Computer America website and get the show notes. Uh, and as Ben pointed out earlier, we never get through all the stories <laughs> Put together. We try, but though. it gives. Well, we try, but it gives you a nice resource. You can go back and catch the stories we didn't catch, or get the links and the video links and everything for all the things we're going to talk about. With that said, what's going on is that the MIT and Harvard guys say if the technology proves successful, it could address flaws associated with other screening methods like temperature checks, which we're also familiar with now. So going on, it says how these masks could be used. Well, your eye could use it on the way to and or from work as a self-test, as it were. Hospitals mm -hmm. could use it for patients as they come in or wait in the waiting room as a pre-screen for who's infected. Or at airports to monitor passengers, perhaps. Doctors might even use these masks with these specialized sensors to diagnose patients on the spot without having to send samples to a laboratory. That's compelling. And then at the time when testing snafus, and it, right now the world we're in right now is a time of testing snafus and delays, which have hampered many countries' ability to control outbreaks. Tools that quickly identify patients are critical. So anything like this that could help is of interest. And the team is also exper experimenting with various design options. So right now, the lab is debating whether to embed the sensors inside of a mask or develop a module that can be attached to any over-the-counter mask. I vote for the latter. Let's get something out there that I could take and use on my existing mask as opposed to having to buy a specifically made mask with this sensor inside. So fun story. 
It, it, it's uh it definitely reminds me of a couple things. First of all, one thing that we didn't mention here on the show at all, um, <laughs> you know, it, it kind of reminded me how you said that many countries are hampered by their ability to control this, uh, you know, coronavirus at the moment because of their ability to test. Uh, mm -hmm. One piece of good news that we didn't cover was New Zealand was the first country with like over a thousand cases at one point. Uh, they completely eradicated coronavirus from within. Like they had no yeah. active cases. Uh, so that that's quite amazing. But of course, what led to that was active testing. This yeah. would definitely make it easier. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm wondering if it's cost effective, easy, accessible, because wow. I, I don't know about you, but at least here in North Carolina, even though, um, you know, they're, they're experiencing a second rise in cases. Yeah. Um, getting tested is still pretty hard to do. Oh, it, it's, yeah. oh, it's yeah. not, it's not the most accessible. So if this just adds to, you know, the availability, I'm all for it. And then the second part that I was going to say was, um, the the fact that it could test for multiple diseases uh i think they chose all the you know the all the hottest topics the zika the coronavirus the ebola right. um you know kind of all all the headlines although i think ebola actually is pretty hard to catch but still um i'm wondering if this could also be you know used for you know things more mundane like the common cold or flu or any of these symptoms but uh, interesting interesting very cool yeah, very could cool be, could be I, I i i like the idea of retrofitting existing masks because that's me too yeah, that, that, you know, being able to fit into a world that we already live in, that's great. Uh, story number one. So, story number two, like you said, face mask to face mask. What's this one? Okay, the second story is, what if your face mask, let's take it to the next level, okay? What if your face mask could kill coronavirus with electricity? Now, I researched this story in two outlets, one an article in Popular Mechanics and another article in Textile Magazine, believe it or not. Really an interesting story that kind of caught the attention of people in the industry. So last month, as I recall, we talked about uh, Harvard. Oh, oh, no, just moments ago, we talked about the uh, lighting up mask that Harvard and MIT people are working on, right? Yep. Now, two Japanese companies, Murata Manufacturing and Tajin Frontier, are working on a fabric for masks that could kill the coronavirus upon contact. Now, this is... <laughs> Okay, the new antimicrobial fabric is called Pycelex, that's P-I-E-C-L-E-X. And here's what makes this new breakthrough fabric so interesting. When the fabric expands or contracts due to human movement, such as breathing or other motions, it generates a low level of electricity. And the electricity generated by the fabric can kill the coronavirus upon contact and can zap microorganisms without the use of chemical agents. Ding, ding, ding. That's so cool. Now, the plan, of course, as you can imagine, is to create and test masks using mm -hmm. this innovative fabric. And here's something I, I'm sure you're already tuned into this, Ben. A little technical side note, though. The fabric's ability to generate electricity is due to the piezoelectricity phenomenon. So piezoelectricity refers to the ability of certain materials to develop an electric charge in response to an applied mechanical force or movement. In fact, there are piezoelectricity based um, things for smart clothing that can generate low yeah. levels of electricity to recharge, say, a cell phone or something like that's, that. So it's, that's it's just out there. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The, that's just what I was thinking. I, I think that we covered it with you actually uh, a, yeah. a number of years ago where they were looking at this to, you know, when smart clothing was becoming more of a thing and mainly yeah. for for athletes to charge little sensors with embedded in the clothing, they would use this technology. Yeah, very cool. And so now, great story, very encouraging, super exciting. Wouldn't it be great to have a mask that zaps the bad stuff as, if, as you're breathing it in? I, yeah. I love it. But reality check. So the articles made it clear that it may be quite a long time before the new fabric can be fully tested and deployed. Why? Well, um, you can imagine this. One of the key barriers to deploying the new fabric is getting samples of the coronavirus to fully validate the scope of the electricity generating fabrics coronavirus killing cap capability. So until they can really do all the full testing and so forth, but the initial indications are very uh, promising and it's a super interesting innovation. And again, shows how all this innovation is coming from around the world. So many people are working on 
tools and techniques and other things to help in the war against the coronavirus. Uh, using uh, existing technology for a new application, you yeah. know, that, that's always a great field to look for innovation. Uh, I'm surprised that they're having trouble finding coronavirus because, hey, head on <laughs> over to the U.S. I think we have like 2 million past cases. Uh, or, yeah, we just went two, past 2 million. But uh, as lo- as long as the end result of this isn't like, uh, Ralph, I'm sure that you know static electricity in the winter months, you touch a doorknob or you touch anything, as long as it doesn't like permanently turn you into a static electricity being, um, <laughs> this could be pretty cool. More testing, yeah. but very nice. Uh, yes. Story number three. Um, yes. Dr- drones. Uh, I, I don't know where the story is going, but talk to us about <laughs> pandemic drones. Well, that's part of the reason I picked this story, because the headline I thought was so interesting. Pandemic drone could help detect infections in crowds. And I went, what? This is from an outlet uh, called New Atlas. And uh, let's get into the story here. So a little kind of tongue-in-cheek opening here. It says, if you see a drone fly by in the future, it could be looking for evidence of COVID-19. The University of South Australia and Canadian or Canada based Canadian mm-hmm, yeah. company called a drone company called Dragonfly, and it's an unusual spelling for the word, by the way, have teamed up to develop a pandemic drone platform that uses special sensors and computer vision to find people with infectious respiratory diseases. So it's not exclusively just COVID 19, but it could be applied here. So, according to the team, the new drone is capable of monitoring someone's temperature heart rate and respiratory rate it can also detect sneezing and coughing this works even in crowds they claim including those at offices can you imagine a drone flying around your office well maybe airports cruise ships and nursing care homes ha the technology behind the covid 19 drone was originally unveiled in 2017 by a team of researchers at the University of South Australia when they demonstrated their ability to measure heart and breathing rates, analyze human movements to detect coughing and sneezing at a distance of up to 33 feet using drone videos and with 165 feet from fixed cameras. And the university team admits the detection rate isn't perfect, but it's a practical tool for seeing if the disease is present in a cr- present in a crowd. Can you imagine that? With I don't know, say you start having football games again, and you have a crowd. Maybe they're still spaced out in the in the stadium. But this could be something you could fly around and look for evidence of problems. Maybe I don't know. It's a pretty out there story. <laughs> yeah. Well, and and of course, uh, I think something paired with contact tracing, you know, that is getting more and more attention. Uh, just the fact that hey, someone in your vicinity. Uh, you know, showed signs of coronavirus and, you know, like all this could be automated, like you said, at large events and things like that. Uh, By the way, that article that led to, I guess, the, the previous article that, you know, um, Oh, Oh, wow. I'm looking at your screen. Yeah. 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 uh, Drone tech can tell if bodies are dead or alive. And, you know, (gasps) they linked to that article within, um, within this article that you linked. Yeah. And uh, so, so essentially I guess they're just repurposing technology, you know, just like last, just like the last story. Um, They could tell if someone was breathing or not breathing uh, based on the drone. And I guess they measure, I guess the wow. movements of a person's chest. Um, that's 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 actually profound for natural disaster situations. Let's say you could fly a drone over an area with, God forbid, a whole bunch of bodies and be able to identify uh, someone who's still alive and get help to them. Wow, yeah, that's I, I I have I have no idea what the actual applications of something like this would be. Obviously, to tell if someone is alive or dead, um, right? You know, from a distance with a drone, but then being able to turn it into this the pandemic drone, which is can test for not just breathing or not breathing, but breathing normally and coughing or sneezing or any of these yeah, erratic yeah. symptoms. So it's it's a, it's a wild story, but I thought it was kind of an interesting twist on the old drone deal. <laughs> yeah, uh, they they actually you know uh, drones do have a lot of applications it's just i guess finding the best use for it and yeah. I, I i i like the uh was it throwing everything against the wall and seeing what sticks yes that, yes that's the stage that we're at right now and amen um, yeah so there you go drones <laughs> maybe they might stick so story number four startup uses yes. fever detection camera technology to stop the spread of coronavirus um I could say, uh, Rob, before we even get started with this, have you had your temperature taken at any facilities? Like, you know, going to the grocery store, going not to... Not yet. Me not either. Yet. Me either. It's not in wide practice around here either. 
but no, it's coming. No, not yet. It, but it, you've got so many of those handheld, uh, you, you know, yeah. you just put it a few inches or so from the person's forehead and get a reading real quick. I expect to see that happening pretty soon, but I haven't seen it I uh, think, yet. I think that's going to be more widely used to screen people who, mm-hmm. you know, who are coming into, you know, places. I think they do that at airports right now. But yeah, uh, so it, it's coming uh, more widely and taking temperature is going to be a huge part right. in stopping coronavirus. Ralph, story number four. Yeah, and this comes from Forbes magazine. And as you said before, the headline was Startup uses fever detection camera technology to stop spread of coronavirus. So it's uh, it, you're going to find out that the technology in, in its basic form is not really that new, but there's a twist on how these guys are using it. So here's the story. When Athena security started in 2018, their mission was to use thermal imaging and computer vision camera system to detect guns concealed Mm. under clothing for use at airports or any entrance areas managing large crowds. So that was the original intent of this company's technology. And again, this is another one of these repurposing stories. So now they are using the same technology to detect fevers in the hopes of mitigating the spread of coronavirus. So Athena Security uses infrared cameras and an algorithm that analyzes body temperature to detect people who have, who have a temperature higher than 100 degrees. So that's the trigger. Mm-hmm. In specific, and this is the part that I thought was so interesting. I, I mean, in a way, I'd like to learn more about this, but it says, in specific, the camera system focuses on the inner eye. What? Which is the closest point to your base body temperature that and can detect within plus or minus 0.3 degrees centigrade accuracy. So the inner eye thing is really interesting. Obviously, you look into the camera oh, thing. Oh, well, isn't well, that weird? Uh, and, and, and I'm sorry, because I, I never had heard of the inner eye. Uh, I, I had always yeah, heard it referred to as the third eye. Um, ah. have, have, have you ever heard of the third eye? Well, that's isn't that the <laughs> yeah just... it, it, for and, and and you know take it take it for what you will. My information comes from an old documentary I kind of fell asleep to uh, years ago. But what I recall about the third eye or the inner eye, as they call it, is the spot that people have that uh, has a lot of the same uh, I guess kind of uh, nerve nerve endings and sensors. Okay, but it's kind of yeah. like on your forehead, and it's the reason why humans evolved this so that when you you know uh, when the sun comes up. And, you know, you can see the light without it actually opening your eyes. It's not coming through oh, your wow. eyelids. It's actually sensing it through that third eye. That detects, oh, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and that detects light so that, you know, humans can wake up during the day. You know, they can get up with the sun. So oh, it's, cool. it, it, it's kind of like an old evolutionary trait, but uh, I never knew it was the best place to sense temperature. That, that's new to me. Well, that that is, yeah, that makes it even more curious and bizarre and interesting and clever, I suppose. So it goes on to say, if the temperature, you know, high temperature is detected, the camera sends an immediate alert to the owners, operators, or individual monitoring the space in question. Now, the company claims that with their technology, they can analyze a thousand people per hour. So that's a that's pretty good. Not bad. Uh, not for, bad for an airport. Yeah. Not bad. Not bad is right. This technology is not new. However, during the 2003 SARS and 2009 swine flu epidemics, airports across the U.S. used thermal imaging cameras to spot travelers who had fevers. So that part's not new. But what's different about Athena's system that we've been talking about is its ability to send out immediate alerts to the appropriate managing parties who can then make an informed decision on how to act. So that's what they claim is the differentiator. And then the issue, of course, the article talks about is, well, okay, this is all well and good. What about privacy? Now, according to the company's website, Athena's system does not display a person's race or ethnicity, does not track, collect, or distribute any personable, personal, pardon me, identifiable, let me try that again, (laughs) collect or distribute any personal identifiable information from the subject's uh, process. So right. it's just an interesting thing. That little twist, though, about the uh, the uh, inner eye, I thought that was really interesting. And your comments about that were super fun. Yeah, it's uh, I, I, <laughs> I learned something new that that's the best way to. Uh, and, 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 you know, I always see people pointing it at the forehead. And now it makes sense because that's where your your inner eye is, is kind of like right between your your eyebrows. And so interesting. Uh, yeah, so, so that makes sense. But 
I like that they said the only thing that's really changed from 2009 or 2003, the real change was that they were able to get it onto Wi-Fi and now it can send a signal and say, uh, help, alert, there's someone with a fever walking through the airport. So Yeah, and, I, and like the drone story before, the bit about being able to process a thousand people per hour, you combine these things together and it's just going to help expedite that um, detection that's, capability. And, and and really, uh, you know, and people may be sitting out there thinking, well, what's the point? You know, they're already in the airport. They have fevers like that is what could have saved hundreds of thousands of lives, you know, mm. across the world is mm. being able to detect these things in mm -hmm. early stages because, you know, it, it's not about locking everyone in quarantine. That's just mm -hmm. kind of like that's how we do it now because we don't have the technology maybe in the exactly. future in the next five years we can kind of just say you 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 all of you have the symptoms that could be associated with it you go on lockdown everyone continues their lives we'll take care yeah. of everyone yeah. who may be sick and everyone yeah. can continue on so i guess that's yeah. where that's where technology is trying to get us we're trying to get into that future where we can identify it quickly and, and deal with it well and, and to your point ben Think about if we can achieve these kinds of technologies, get them deployed, get them viable, get them field tested, as it were. God forbid we have a resurgence, a major, say, two or three years from now, another COVID-19 kind of disaster. Well, we'll be in a lot better shape to do well, exactly what you were just talking about. Exactly. It's all it's all about future proofing. And uh, as, as many uh, is it epidemiologists, it, whatever, mm -hmm. it, it, it's whatever scientists study viruses, they say it's not just if it's when and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they were probably the next one. But hey, let's uh, we're not all cyborgs yet. So we have to <laughs> we have to future proof ourselves some other way. Now, story number five, let's go ahead and get into this one. Um, yeah, uh, still on the coronavirus, but you know, yep. we had we had drones, we had <laughs> smart fabrics. Now, I guess we're on to robots. <laughs> yes, yes. And this is probably one of the very few times I'll ever be picking up a story from, of all things, Hollywood Reporter. But I just couldn't resist it when I saw this headline. So the headline was Germ Zapping Robots. How Hollywood Might Kill Coronavirus Fears on Set. And I said, okay, I've got to check this out. This is a fun story. So here we go. The world's film and TV industry production managers are now exploring how to resume production safely. And they're talking more specifically about sound stages and sets, right? Because outdoor things can be much easier to control. The challenge is to find creative ways to make sure indoor sets are sanitary in the age of COVID-19. One option includes using germ and virus zapping robots usually found in major hospitals. So again, this is a bit of a story about there's some existing technology. Let's figure out a way to repurpose it uh, mm -hmm. for helping in the fight of, of coronavirus in areas outside of where this original technology was intended, in this case, hospitals. So, for example, San Antonio, Texas-based Xenex, that's X-E-N-E-X, Xenex Disinfection Services, has a lab-certified robot that uses pulses of ultraviolet light to zap the virus that causes COVID-19 and other things, too. Mm -hmm. Now, it's about a three-foot-tall roll-around robot. You can see it in the picture that's in the show notes. To me, it kind of looks like a big shop vac. And it's able to knock out 99.99% of the coronavirus in an environment in just two minutes. Huh. And according to Xenix, the robot offers the first... Now, this is the qualifier. This is what makes this guy a standout, they claim. So according to Xenix... The robot offers the first and only UV disinfection technology proven to destroy the actual virus that causes COVID-19. That's their claim. And then here's how the robot works. Uh, a trained technician places the robot in a designated area. In this case, it would be a soundstage or a set for a TV show. Uh, turns it on and then exits the room. Then for five minutes, the robot generates bursts of high-intensity, full germicidal spectrum ultraviolet C <laughs> or UVC light, which, of course, we can imagine is far more intense than sunlight. It's, it's full germicidal spectrum UVC light means it can take out a host of pathogens susceptible to different wavelengths of light. That was something I found interesting. Didn't think about how some pathogens are not affected by certain wavelengths, others are. This gives this full wavelength uh, treatment, if you will, that knocks out a host of things. That's kind of cool. And here's a key benefit. 
A Xenex robot can quickly kill viruses, bacteria, and spores without damaging materials or equipment, which you can imagine is hugely important for something like the film industry with all the expensive gear they have. And a little bit more here, Xenex robots are already in use in more than 450 hospitals in the United States. So again, it's thinking about this technology. It's there. We've proven that it can also zap the coronavirus. Hey, maybe we could be used in other industries. And Hollywood's looking at this and going, hey, this could help us, right? That's the I love the repurposing part of this. But in recent weeks, the Xenex team reported they've been talking to and approaching major studios and streaming services, including Netflix, Amazon, and Sony. So now for a reality check, all well and good. But this is not inexpensive. I could not find, I searched and searched looking for the leasing uh, price tag, what it would cost to lease one of these robots on a monthly basis or a yearly basis, et cetera. But I did find out if you want to purchase one outright, it's about $125,000 for each robot. And again, you need a trained technician, they say, to uh, use it. So, you, you know, there's not an inexpensive thing. That's why it's really relegated to major hospitals at this point in time who have the kind of budget to support this. I, you know, but at the same time, $125,000, I mean, uh, not too long ago, uh, you know, maybe about two months ago when this whole thing started, we were talking mm -hmm. about the cost of, 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 of respirators. And, mm -hmm. you know, those things, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the, the ones that they use in hospitals are like forty to $60,000, yeah. uh, depending on it. So, like, uh, when it comes to medical supplies, they can get a lot more expensive. You know, $125,000 seems pretty expensive. But, um Hey, you know, the fact that it can be used over and over and over again, and it can uh, clean entire, you know, in this case, movie sets and things like that. I, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in hospitals, and I got to say mm. that I did see these things. They were good for uh, surgical rooms and, and things like that. Yeah. The, the problem is, is that those rooms are set up for cleaning in this manner. Uh, the you know, my, my only critique on this whole thing is that movie sets are not set up like surgical centers. You know, there's there's uh, there's nooks, there's crannies, there's uh, corners, there's you know, yeah. because it's visible, it's visible light spectrum. It can only kill germs where the light can actually shine. So if there's something behind something or whatever, uh, even as simple as like a. a a doorknob like that's why uh, uh, surgical rooms don't have doorknobs it's because you can't you know easily oh, sanitize so them so uh -huh. little things like that um yeah it, it's a good use and whatever gets hollywood back up and running i guess you know no spare no expense but um exactly <laughs> I, I would only say don't expect this in the home anytime soon but it's like you said no. <laughs> nice to see other applications of it so for sure yeah yeah now, this is one that I, I have not been looking into. I know that uh, supercomputers, one of their jobs, yes. you know, uh, whenever we talk about them here on the show, uh, we always say it's for weather modeling. It's for, uh, you know, crunching large sets of data. One very, very, uh, it's for checking for aliens and extraterrestrials. But, uh, <laughs> but we know that one of its major uses is in medicine and folding proteins and, you know, kind of doing, yes. uh, doing this kind of really yes. uh, process heavy computing. I did not know, although it makes perfect sense now that you think about it, that they were doing this with COVID-19 because it's, it's such a priority for so much of the world. But I have not heard anything about this. So this is the first news story I've heard about COVID-19 and supercomputer uh, compu well, computing. Oh, yeah. And in fact, Ben, to your point, uh, there's a, a wonderful, um, gosh, there's a wonderful array of stories out there if you did some research on usage of supercomputers. IBM had a huge announcement uh, a couple months back about how they found something like 77 candidate possible compounds that could, could help thwart the coronavirus's ability to attack our cells. Uh, through simulations, through doing mm. these incredible simulations. And there are other people out there. So this story is kind of a follow-on to that in a way, but with an extra twist. So uh, this comes from HPC Wire, a really, really interesting outlet with some great stuff about supercomputers. So if you're a kind of a supercomputer nut, um, this is a magazine or a part of an online zine, if, as it were, that you should get to know. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's get into the story here, but let's set the stage a little bit. Because this is this is probably our geekiest story today, but but I just love it. So first, set the stage. We've all seen images of the coronavirus, you know, this weird ball thing with these spike-like projections that have ends that look like broccoli uh, spears to me. But anyway, these projections on the coronavirus ball, if you want to call it that, are the spike protein. 
okay? The spike protein helps the coronavirus to attach to human cells and work its way into them where the virus then reproduces itself. So this is sort of a refresh. I think a lot of us have heard this before. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the part that relates to what I was saying to you, Ben, when you talked about being interested in how supercomputers are are being applied in this war against uh, the coronavirus. So much of the supercomputer powered research surrounding COVID-19, such as the IBM supercomputer story I talked about um, recently, I thought we talked about that in a previous show, but nonetheless, has focused on finding simple molecules that could bind to the spike protein and disable it. So that's what most of the supercomputer research has been trying to do, find simple molecules that could bind to the spike protein on the coronavirus and disable it, thwart it, right? Mm. But here's the key, but there's another front in the war against coronavirus that supercomputers are helping with. Instead of looking for molecules that can bind, pardon me, that can bind to the spike protein and disable it, a team of researchers at the University of Texas, El Paso, is now using supercomputers to figure out how the spike protein binds to human cells in the first place. Mm. So stay with me. In specific, The university team is using supercomputers to look at the interaction between the coronavirus spike protein and the human ACE2 or ACE2 protein. Okay, time out. (laughs) What is the ACE2 protein? I know I I told you this is geeky. Yeah. ACE2 is a protein on the surface of many cell types, including cells in critical human organs. ACE2, as it turns out, is the target of the coronavirus spike protein. So the coronavirus and its spike proteins, they're looking for that ACE2, making ACE2 the entry point into the human body for COVID-19. Now, I want to emphasize this point. For coronavirus to invade our bodies, it must be able to interact with the ACE2 protein. So with that said, the university team at El Paso is using the power of supercomputers to run simulations needed to explore and understand this interaction between the coronavirus spike protein and the ACE2 protein. So, and, and, and before we get to your next point, yeah. I just want to make sure that I have this straight in my head so that hopefully everyone out there listening has it straight in their, in their head. Uh, most of the research going into uh, stopping coronavirus is how to, I guess, attach things to that sticky ball that, you know, we've all seen what the coronavirus looks like and essentially, uh, you know, render it unable to connect to anything because those little spikes right. are otherwise... And that's not bad. That's yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that is still a viable way to treat the coronavirus. Uh, but there, these, uh, you know, the University of Texas El Paso, what, what they're doing is finding out how, like you said, the interaction between those spikes and the i guess kind of like the invasion point the 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 cells uh, the ace2 protein that covers right yeah that covers all of our organs so they're attacking the uh, kind of the mechanism how it transferred as opposed to disabling the molecule of the coronavirus just to make sure i have that right and you got it right. And my vote is let's have both of those fronts. Of course, filed. of course. <laughs> let's knock this puppy out. So, so here's a little side note here before we get into the results of their research so far. I can't resist going on the geeky side about the two amazingly powerful supercomputers involved. Uh, first at El Paso, uh, first is the TACC Stampede 2 system delivering 10.7 petaflops of performance, oh my God, and you know this already, Ben, but for the rest of our audience or some of the audience who might not know, each petaflop represents computing speed equal to 1,000, stand by, 1,000 million, million floating point operations per second. It just like melts my brain to think of. Well, and, and for a lot of people out there, <laughs> it, it helps you a little bit, and I, I'm hoping that a lot of people that listen to the show might know something like RAM uh, and you know, or storage. Uh, you know, when it comes to data storage and things like that, uh, right. we are we are pretty securely in the Terra, in, yes. in the terabyte hard drive. You know, it, buying oh, a sure. single terabyte hard drive is not expensive. I'm not talking about SSD, but still, yeah, no, uh, right. we, we went from megabytes of storage to gigabytes of storage to terabytes of storage. Now, after terabyte, I think it goes to peta. It, it, is it peta after terabyte? Um, Gosh, I, I'm not quite uh, sure. I hesitate because I'm not quite sure where it goes after that. <laughs> uh, I, 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 and, and actually, I, I am actually correct. Uh, it, it's peta. So it's uh, it's terabyte, and then it's petabyte. 
So, you know, there you go. so it's uh it's just uh, I think people <laughs> and, and sorry, I'm 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 uh, I'm messed no, up, messing up here a little bit, but people need to know petabyte because we're already starting to measure things in petabytes. You know, back when, you know, Ralph when computers first came out, measuring things in kilobytes and and megabyte, you know, kilo yes. it's like we don't have to worry about megabytes megabytes of ram megabytes of storage you know that's, that's forever outrageous. yeah um but you know we're already starting to get to the point where we're measuring oh, things yeah. in petabytes so i think the average audience member should know how much a petabyte is and because that's where we're going next so yeah, yeah there, there you go. go no that's a great that's a great add-on to that and the second supercomputer is a lone star five uh delivering one petaflop per second performance got considerably less but nonetheless this is all some pretty intense uh, compute power they're throwing after this so okay now for the results of the university of texas at el paso actually team. before oh, you get to yeah. that i i, I want to hit you with a little bit of, a little bit of a quiz um <laughs> th so obviously these are supercomputers that are in use for the study and that kind of thing uh all yeah. going good i'm going to ask you what is the most powerful plan you know planned uh supercomputer because I think Ooh. a couple were just announced. How many petaflops is it oh, going boy. to uh, be capable of? I, I'm not even going to try to answer that. I know IBM's been working on a lot of things, but there's been there's been so much talk about the quantum computers, just far outpacing. That's a completely different topic. So, the, so that's a whole other thing. So if you're talking about well, we'll call it regular, traditional, non-quantum computing supercomputers. Um, I I defer. I I couldn't even. Maybe IBM. I'm not sure. Who's who's on the top end? Uh, the top 500, and I have a list here. The number one is oh, 500. Uh, wow. Yeah, and there's a whole list on on Wikipedia. Cool. Um, is its name is Summit, and it's uh, made by IBM. And let's see. Okay, I think IBM. it it runs a peak of 200 petaflops a second. <laughs> So, you know, uh, these guys are using a 10 petaflop, and there's one already 20 times faster. I think that there was some by the Department of, uh, of Defense in the U.S., and in conjunction with AMD and NVIDIA, they've already announced uh, a s one exaflop. Like, that's currently in production. That's going to be made and should be finished here in the next two or three years. And I think there's already one that is oh, planned and should be wow. finished by 2022, should be 1.5 exaflops which is a thousand petaflops so oh god <laughs> the speed that this advances is mind-blowing so that that, well, yeah. that was a completely no, different and aside and it's yeah. and and one thing that's sort of a profound no duh obvious statement is it isn't just speed for speed sakes friends it's what you can do like like uh, ben was alluding to climate modeling other things that are so enormous or or doing simulations of biological things like looking for compounds that could thwart the coronavirus well, or all of this stuff i mean it's it's be, because i, I and, and and because i i enjoy technology in this arena so much and so do you uh, ralph I, I don't mind you know going on a little tangent about this yeah please uh, do the 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 reason that you know we're doing these simulations and think about if you could model everything about a molecule. You know, a couple of years ago, we talked about, mm -hmm. you know, uh, mm -hmm. scientists were able to recreate a, a tiny, tiny micron sized portion of the universe um, mm -hmm. using a computer. Like they were able to model all the laws of physics. They were able to yeah. model everything. The more computing power that you have, and if we get to this point, if you can accurately model, let's say how coronavirus acts, you have a mm -hmm. digital version of a physical coronavirus that acts exactly like anything else does instead of injecting it into a rodent instead of you know having exactly. human test subjects ha instead of having uh, you know all of this you know kind of waiting for trial and error and that kind of yes. thing if you can model that digitally and you can you know influence it using different proteins folded vaccines that kind of thing um if you can influence it digitally speed up time and see how it works you can have a vaccine in days or weeks instead of months or years that is the end goal and, and you know like you're saying it's not speed for speed's sake there are new there are completely new avenues that are mm -hmm. open to mm -hmm. scientists when when we get this working oh uh, yeah it's it's really even though we're living in a kind of a dark age right now coronavirus and racial uh, tensions and problems mm -hmm. and issues in our country and divisiveness and all these doom and gloom things around the world and it's you could get you could easily get very depressed but on friday 
We're going to lift your spirits with the thought that science and technology is not, well, unless we all just apocalyptically <laughs> disappear, it's going to keep marching forward. And there's, uh, as they say in the carousel of progress at Disney World, there's a great big beautiful tomorrow. <laughs> we, we, we really, and, and, and I, I completely agree with you. Uh, admittedly, computer modeling can't solve racism, but we are on the cusp of being able to solve a lot of diseases. And you said quantum computers, uh, the conservative estimates for yeah. that are going to be like 20, 30 years before they're mm -hmm. actually out mm -hmm. there doing mm -hmm. stuff. But, you know, in the next 10 years, the technology that we have today is going to be so refined. And then 20, 30 years, we have quantum computers and that's going to get refined. We're on the cusp of so many advancements. Um, yeah. It's really a good time to be alive. Despite yeah. all this you know heartache yeah. out there it, it, yeah, it's good no, it's good it's good you're right you're right we've done a public service here we've there given some reason to continue on <laughs> okay Absolutely. so now now a little bit about the results that this university of texas at el paso team have come up with uh, in this uh, goal to find a way of thwarting the ability of the coronavirus to uh, attach with the a ace2 uh, cells. So here we go. Using all that horsepower, the team has identified some of COVID-19 specific amino acids that might play crucial roles in the process that binds ACE2 to the coronavirus spike protein. So the, the, the mechanism of that binding, that mating, if you will, of ACE2 to the coronavirus spike protein has to do with specific amino acids, and they've been able to identify some of those. It's sort of they're like getting close, right? In specific, the, t the team has discovered that on COVID-19, there are about 20 important amino acid residues interacting with ACE2. And what they are doing now is trying to identify the roles of those key amino acids acids. So this is ongoing research. So they're not done yet, but God bless them. They're on their way. The bottom line on two fronts today, as we've talked about, supercomputers are key weapons in the war against coronavirus. One front, thwart the spike, just knock the spike out so it can't connect to anything. Front two, figure out a way to, to thwart the the mating process yeah. of the spike on the coronavirus with the ACE2. Uh, and if we can do both of those fronts, We'll have I, a powerful weapon. Yeah, I, I, I guess their their end result, if it's possible, I would assume that they would, you know, you take some kind of medication, you would take something that would alter the um, the amino acids in your mm -hmm. body, mm -hmm. and potentially mm -hmm. just, you know, a little tweak by medication turns into a full blown vaccine. Interesting. Maybe, sure. maybe, maybe. So there's that, uh, Ralph. We <laughs> we have about 15 minutes left, and yeah. I wanted so uh, let's go ahead and do the next story, uh, story number seven. Um, last coronavirus and then we're going to hit up some of the other sure. stories that you bet uh, you yeah. bet you bet we've been geeking out on coronavirus but this one's kind of cool so this comes from a stanford university a website announcement headline stanford university seeks information from fitbit and apple watches to help predict covid19 well that headline i went oh i gotta find out about that so first what's the goal the stanford team is trying to see if data collected from wearable devices can be used to help predict the onset of COVID-19 before the actual symptoms start. That's, I like that. Right now, they are looking for volunteers who own a wearable device, such as a Fitbit watch, an Apple watch, or similar products. It's not exclusively just those two. And who also meet this set of criteria. Have a confirmed or suspected case of COVID-19 or have been exposed to somebody who has COVID-19 or are at higher risk of exposure, such as healthcare workers or grocery store workers. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what they're looking for volunteers there. And, and friends, if anyone listening out here is interested, please find out about this. Uh, maybe you want to volunteer. Anyway, how the program works. Participants install an app on their smartphone and smartwatch. The smartphone app will be used to collect physiological data from your smartwatch and correlate this with any symptoms you report. Within the smartphone app, there is a daily symptom check-in survey, which should take no more than one or two minutes to fill out, so it's not a big burden on the user. Here is the range of data the, the Stanford team plans to track. Step count, body movement, electrical changes in the skin due to stress, skin temperature, your location via GPS, the amount of oxygen in your blood, your blood pressure, and the quality of your sleep. 
it's pretty ambitious. The team reports they have previously shown that data from smartwatches such as heart rate can be used for early detection of infectious disease even before the appearance of symptoms. Based on past success, they're hoping to apply this approach for early detection of COVID-19. So fun story. Where do you want to go next, Ben? Yeah. Uh- so yeah, uh, you, you flew through that one. I definitely like that. And by the way, a lot of that, uh, a, a, a lot of the bios that they wanted to collect, um, that's actually bios that, uh, hey, you know, the Fitbit and the Apple Watch already collect. So they essentially yes. just want the information that's already there, and they want to yep. be able to study it. So uh, story number nine looked fun, but I wanted to go to story number ten because this is one uh, about a. It's been about a week, week and a half oh, since yes. SpaceX sent the first uh, American crew on an American spacecraft Yay. from an American site to uh, <laughs> to the space station since like 2000 or since the end of the space program yes, in like 2011, yes. I think. Um, yeah. Something like that. So I had heard all about that. I'm sure a lot of people watched the video. The video footage was amazing. It was awesome to see. Um, this is the fun fact that I did not, I had never heard anyone mention. So let's talk about yeah, story number 10. Yeah, that's why... Yeah, that's why I jumped on this. And would it be two weeks ago tomorrow that they launched? Is Some, something weeks? like that. I it, it was a Saturday. I'm embarrassed to say or, I, you know, time is flying by so fast to your point <laughs> earlier. Anyway. Okay. So this comes from 3dprint.com, which if you're into 3D printing is a great outlet. Uh, headline was uh, headline was SpaceX astronauts wore custom 3D printed helmets. And we've got a link and all this good stuff here for you. Uh, and there's a video on mashable.com too. That's kind of cool. So One thing about SpaceX Dragon astronauts, they travel in style. If you've seen their outfits, you know that's true. In addition to super cool Dragon capsule, and that thing is amazing, the crew's lightweight and sleek spacesuits are unlike anything we've seen before. Uh, The spacesuits look great, but what's really remarkable is they were custom made for each astronaut's body. For example, the helmets were custom manufactured for each astronaut's head shape using 3D pre- uh, technology, 3D printing technology, rather. Uh, advanced features of the helmet include built-in air cooling, mechanisms for visor retraction and locking, as well as microphones within the helmet structure. So uh, again, you just all you have to do is just look at their helmets, look at their outfits, uh, spacesuits, and you can see how different they look from what we've seen before, right? I mean, it's very, very cool in style. <laughs> I, it, it it's uh it's kind of crazy that you know we, we talk about all the money although I, I guess in the long run the we only spent like a couple billion like two or three billion on the space program uh to yeah. get people to the moon which is you know an amazing feat still to this day but um technology has advanced to the point where hey every astronaut gets a custom helmet uh admittedly you know there's only how many astronauts uh out there that are training or Gosh. going into space uh i don't know that's I a can, good question i can only imagine a couple dozen you know uh we can't send Probably. that many uh people up there but yeah. still everyone gets their own helmet thanks to 3d printing so that Yay. that is a fun fact absolutely yeah that's uh, cool so, story number and by the way, that was story number 10 if following along uh story number uh 12 look cool but story number 13 uh is uh, I, I don't know a nice fun mix of cool and post-apocalyptic world that you were talking about that I like story number 13 for weird reasons. So let's do yes, that. Yes, yes. Well, it is. It's, it's, it, it's kind of cool. Uh, the headline is Samsung backs up a startup that makes fake windows that generate artificial sunlight. And this is a story from The Verge, which is a great outfit. Um, and and this, is, this is more than your kind of um, light... Uh, devices that you have for people who have light sensitivity disorders and so forth. But anyway, let me get into the story. One of the latest startups supported by Samsung is an outfit called Sunny 5. The Sunny 5 team claims they have developed an artificial window that supposedly delivers all the benefits of natural sunlight. The Sunny 5 window looks similar in function to light therapy lamps marketed to sufferers of seasonal affective disorder, or of course the acronym SAD. (laughs) And many many people are familiar with those. My daughter uses one. She loves it. Yeah. Now their window that they've developed, it outputs the full spectrum of natural light and can be programmed to mimic the lighting effects of a real window. This is where it starts getting interesting and different than your uh, therapy lights, right? We're taking this to a whole new level. Some cool features that make it more interesting than the typical light therapy lamp include the angle of the light changes throughout the day. 
like it's imitating the movement of the sun, right? The angle of the light changes throughout the day and incorporates various sunlight scenarios, such as sunrise, dawn, dusk, and sunset. <laughs> that's, that's very cool. And a companion app lets users tweak the color temperature and brightness. So it's a symbiotic relationship with your, your smartphone. According to Samsung, the product helps users synthesize vitamin D while they are indoors or in low lit places without having to worry about skin aging or sunburn. <laughs> An early version of the product was demonstrated at the Consumer Electronics Show earlier this year in Las Vegas. No pricing or availability are announced yet, but I thought this is really cool for people who might be in, uh, you know, imagine uh, somebody's in a long-term hospital care situation where they might not have it, as much natural light as should be provided. This could be great. Uh, it's, I just thought this was very clever. You know, and, and while you're doing that article, I was actually looking at this other article from uh – from Smithsonian, and it was oh, actually yeah. when fresh air went out of fashion in hospitals, and mm. it was, and it's this, you know, well-researched article going back to the early 1900s, talking about wow. how, um, you know, fresh air and ultraviolet uh, and ultraviolet radiation and you know UV light, uh, like yeah. we talked about way back, story number three or four or something like that, uh, sure. was a natural disinfectant, and you know now we mm, have those robots. Mm. Now we have different. You know now we have uh, we have antibacterial soap. We have you know filters <laughs> for air systems, things like that. Yeah. Uh, Windows in hospitals are kind of a holdover, you know. They're uh, they're they're yeah. not they're not really useful uh, like they once were. So maybe something like these windows that uh, you know, hey, hey, look, germ zapping robot, exactly what I was talking about. Um, yeah. Maybe having this window in places like hospitals would make them cleaner, better, and hopefully not as well sterile for the patients. Even though it will yeah. be sterile for the patients. So <laughs> there you go. Um, a yeah. little less. Yeah, just a little less. So some of these other stories, Rob, we have like two minutes if we just want to go over the stories that we didn't do, just kind of read the headline. Sure, and, uh, sure. Yeah, do that. You so well, st my starting with story number nine, by the way. Okay, yeah, let me scroll back up here yeah, real sure. quick. Here we go. Oh, yeah. So uh, Alphabet, that's the uh, research division of Google, if you're probably familiar. So Alphabet's balloon-powered loon, that's L-O-O-N, <laughs> internet, comes to Mozambique. It's all a story about this fascinating uh, airy, this balloon that's positioned on the edge of space that they've developed that in all intents and purposes to super simplify this story, uh, this loon balloon is a solar powered super 4G cell tower, as it were, kind of sort of flying approximately 12.5 miles above the Earth's surface. The idea is to get 4G cell service uh, communications capabilities to underserved and completely unserved areas of the world, such as parts of Africa and so forth. And what I think is really fun is artificial intelligence allows the balloon to be guided in a constant figure eight pattern to stay in position over the area of the earth to be served. Really cool. They're doing this in Mozambique. They're going to do it in Kenya and on from there. So just a fun story. That's a cool one. And then we already talked about the helmets. Let's see. Oh, story 11, one of my favorites, how bioprinting human skin could end animal testing and improve skin transplants. The story I picked up from Autodesk Redshift magazine about a company in India. Check it out. It's really an interesting story about how they're creating something they call InnoSkin. And if it matches up well with human skin, it could be a really a big boost for testing, but also for skin grafts, which is very yeah. exciting. So that's a cool story. And let's see what else. Oh, the uh, story 12, Boeing delivers first loyal wingman drone prototype for testing. This is a drone that's not just a uh, autonomous drone or, or one rather flown by some guy in a, with a joystick off on the military base. No, no, no. This is meant to be a companion, like a pilot fish in a symbiotic relationship with a manned fighter plane or a, a fleet of, of planes. So it's very, very different. Something Boeing developed with the Australian Air Force. We're going to do it too. Uh, it's just a remarkable story about military technology. And again, what I love so much is the mm -hmm. idea of it working with in harmony and concert with manned jets. And it also can be a, a traditional a drone as well, but yeah. a really cool, flexible product. So, it, and and uh, to even add to that one, a story that we did a little while ago was uh, this one in uh, the article just 
came out oh, uh, yeah. yesterday. Or, I'm sorry, it actually just came out today. Uh, oh. Drone versus fighter jet, and this is going to take place in 2021. The Air Force oh, is wow. setting up, and essentially they're going to have, you know, like you said, a drone completely control a plane, and it's going to go head to head against an actual manned fighter jet in aerial combat. Obviously, yeah. you know, it's going to be completely safe, and no one's going to get hurt. Sure, but yeah, we're going to see the extent to which if a drone. Oh, yeah can compete against a human in terms of combat, which is wow. a huge step forward. So everyone, yeah. there's music playing in the background. I want to thank you so much. And Ralph, uh, if people want to find out more, where's the best place to go? Super easy. Just point your browser to my name, Ralph Bond, and you'll see a listing. We're looking for the reference to Computer America and KEX Radio and click on that. And you'll get to my website and you'll see all the show notes and all the good stuff. Of course, you can get it at ComputerAmerica.com as well. Perfect. And it's right there. So everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. That's about it. Uh, wow. That is it for us today. And thank goodness, I'm my brain's given out. Everyone have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone.